to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore. Today on the show, we have Dennis McKenna and Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. He's an ethnobotanist and really a wonderful conservationist working in the Amazon, doing great work to save both the rainforest and indigenous peoples who are under great threat from uh, industrialization and modern market pressures. So really a great show. We get to talk about the ESPD 50 ethno botanical search for uh, psychoactive drugs, 50, which was an event and also a book. Uh, so last year, Symposia, Dennis McKenna and uh, his publisher, I think Synergetic Press out of uh, New Mexico got together and put on this event in the UK with all of these uh, stars in ethnobotany and it's folks they've all known forever colleagues and uh, they got together and uh, gave talks on their latest research and as a result they were able to put together this volume uh, ESPD 50 or volume 2 and it really encompasses a huge amount of new material that wasn't even known about 50 years ago when Richard Evans Schultze put on the first event uh, 50, yeah, 50 years ago, I think in San Francisco. So that was a government sanctioned and funded event. This one was not so much, but it's really cool that Dennis and, uh, the rest of the team were able to put it together. Mark Plotkin had, uh, was a direct student of Richard Evan Schulte, Schulte's and he was actually, Richard Evan Schulte's was kind of the Western discoverer, uh, white guy discoverer of ayahuasca and a number of other really amazing compounds and plants. And, Mark Plotkin got to study with him, and uh, it was really cool. We get into a little bit of that story as well. So uh, I think enough of me ranting here, but I think you're going to enjoy this episode and uh, check out the book, ESPD50.com, Synergetic Press, and uh, I think we're going to be able to do a giveaway soon on uh, some copies of this book, so stay tuned for that. All right, enjoy the show. Now for a word from the sponsors, and we'll get into it. We wanted to take the time to thank our sponsor, Bluebird Botanicals. Bluebird Botanicals is an excellent CBD company based in uh, the Boulder, Colorado region. And I actually personally know, I would say, six or more employees at that company. And uh, one of my good friends decided uh, they wanted to partner with us. And I've actually known known these guys for a really long time and I really trust the products. I think I even took it in 2011 if they were around at that point. It was it was really early days and I started uh, taking a CBD product. I thought I thought it was bootleg. It's actually legal um, to take across state lines. Um, I, I think I flew with it across the country because it doesn't have THC in it. It is legal <laughs> and it's legal in all states in the U.S. except for South Dakota. And uh, I don't believe Bluebird can currently ship internationally, though I'm sure as soon as that's possible, they'll do it. It's a great company, a great product. If you don't know too much about CBD, I suggest you dig in and, and check it out. It is really cool and definitely something you should check out. I've been using it. My girlfriend's been using it. Kyle has been using it. And uh, I, I kind of take it right before bed. And I find it helps me slow down at the end of the day. I'm a little speedy. So it helps me chill right out. Yeah. So that's it for Bluebird. Thanks to Bluebird for sponsoring us again. And really appreciate it. If you want to try psychedelic mushrooms in a legal setting, in Jamaica with us. You still have some time to sign up. We've got a retreat coming up uh, May 16th through 23 in Jamaica, and we still have room left. Uh, applications keep coming in, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's not sold out yet. So if you want to check it out, mycomeditations.com and hit the application button there. You can learn more on the site, mycomeditations.com. And uh, if you're interested and uh, we need some info from us, hit us up, psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. The trip will entail three mushroom sessions, two breathwork sessions, and a lot of kind of class time and uh, plenty of time to relax because we are going to be in a very beautiful place in Jamaica. So check that out. And we'd love to have you if you're interested in coming. If you want to support the show with some small, regular donations. We have a Patreon site, patreon.com slash psychedelics today. And you can give us a small uh, monthly donation or donations by show. So check that out. You can give as little as a dollar a month if you want to just help us out a little bit, pay the bills and keep the lights on. And 
uh, just keeping improving the quality of the show. In the near future, I think we need to buy some new microphones, and uh, I think Kyle and I might need some new PCs to keep the editing going. So if you want to support us there, that would be lovely. Patreon.com slash Psychedelics Today. Psychedelics Today has partnered with Daniel McQueen over at Medicinal Mindfulness on this new and very exciting project you've heard about on our show a bunch and maybe elsewhere, extended state DMT research. So the concept is to use a IV pump and keep a steady blood concentration of DMT in the bloodstream for, uh, you know, uh, an undetermined amount of time. Uh, Rick Strassman, I think, responded that he would like to try it the first time for a few weeks or something silly like that, maybe just a week. But, uh, (laughs) you know, I think the initial phases of the study will be maybe 20 minutes, 10 minutes, just to extend that blood concentration peak of DMT that you would get from a free base or an insufflated dose of DMT. And uh, it's more from a psychonaut perspective, which is interesting. It's not just for medical research. It's for our community. We want to know what happens. And you have an opportunity to participate. We have on our Teachable platform over at psychedelicstoday.teachable.com a class for sale called the DMTX Psychonaut Training. And it is the first step. If you want to be a candidate for this, um, you might have to really work. Uh, it's kind of like an astronaut program, like NASA grade kind of selection for participants. So check that out. Teachable uh, is hosting our class, psychedelicstoday.teachable.com. Kyle and Daniel McQueen ran a multi-week class and you can get the bulk of it there. And yeah, the class proceeds go to support the psychonaut training and getting uh, funding enough to push this through to make it legal to do in the States. So yeah, again, check that out, psychedelicstoday.teachable.com and see if you uh, want to pick up that class, DMTX Psychonaut Training. Finally here, if you want to support the show but can't afford to buy a t-shirt or a mug from our shop, feel free to just leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, anywhere really, Google. Um, Tell your friends, share your favorite episodes with them or um, maybe ask your uh, significant other or parents for (laughs) for a seat to our class, uh, Navigating Psychedelics, so you can keep yourself safe. So again, yeah, we'd love to have uh, you tell your friends about the show or just plug us on, um, on your socials. Thanks again for listening and enjoy this great show with Mark Plotkin and Dennis McKenna. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, Kyle and I get the wonderful opportunity to talk to Dr. Mark Plotkin and Dennis McKenna. Thank you guys both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. My pleasure. So I believe everybody listening to this show should know you, Dennis. I would hope. If you don't, I, I, I think our listeners might be doing something wrong. But Dr. Mark Plotkin... You are uh, a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say tangential, but you're, you're directly related to this field, but you're taking it in a different approach by doing land conservation work in partnership with tribes in the Amazon. Um, I think you are still doing a lot of map work, like helping uh, in indigenous groups in the Amazon learn how to do mapping for conservation. But, uh, I, you know, a lot of the TED videos and articles you've had up, those are a few years old. I'm, I'm wondering what you've been up to the last handful of years. Well, I'm an ethnobotanist by training. I was a student of Richard Schultes, who loomed large in the conference we just did in England. And uh, I quickly saw that in working with indigenous peoples, that not only was the forest threatened, but so were their cultures and so was the knowledge they possessed. So about 21 years ago, I set up the Amazon conservation team, co-founded it with my partner, Liliana, who's an expert in protected areas. And the focus is protecting not just rainforests, but indigenous lands. And we've had the great pleasure of mapping and improving management and protection of over 80 million acres of rainforest. And that includes everything from the original ayahuasca tribes uh, that Schultes work with to uh, groups that were more recently contacted. That's fantastic. Um, I, th- I think that's a really huge uh, jumping off point. You are a direct student of uh, Schultz's, uh, which is pretty incredible. 
Um, were, were you a student at Harvard uh, under him? I was actually a college dropout, and a friend of mine told me, if you're at Harvard, you might as well check out the night school. And there's this crazy old guy who went to the Amazon in 1941 and went native for 14 years, and that was Professor Schultes. So he was not only a great ethnobotanist and a great conservationist, but a great teacher, and really uh, many of the people, if not most of the people in the ethnobotanical field were colleagues, devotees, or people inspired by him. And he connected people like Dennis and me and many others. Awesome. Dennis, you studied with him a little bit, or was he a teacher of yours? No, I can't claim that. I wish I could. I'm jealous as hell, actually, <laughs> of Mark and other people that did get the chance to study with him. Uh, I tried. Uh, I did apply to Harvard. And in 1974, I made a pig pilgrimage to Harvard on a Greyhound bus. I was living in Berkeley at the time. I, I went to four days on a Greyhound bus to get to Schultz. He was extremely kind. Uh, you know, I must have looked like just one of many scruffy hippies that probably showed up in his, in his office. But, you know, he closed down the office, took me to lunch at the faculty club and all that. But when I, and he said, you have to go back to college and get more organic chemistry and more taxonomy. And, and so I immediately took that to heart and went back and I had already graduated, but I enrolled in Fort Collins and uh, Colorado State University and took those subjects. It didn't do any good. Other higher forces at Harvard decided I wasn't really qualified. But I ended up working for another uh, lesser known but equally uh, excellent mentor at the University of British Columbia, Dr. Neil Towers. And of course, he and Towers were, were friends. And uh, that gave me actually a perspective, I think, that I, I'm still grateful for, because Towers was basically a chemist. And, you know, so we learned a lot of chemistry, a lot of pharmacognosy. And uh, Schultes was more of a you know, uh, classical botanist, those are things I wouldn't have learned if I studied under him. But it was still, it was great to meet him and we kept in touch with him the year. I think eventually he, you know, uh, I, I was able to make some contributions and he was aware of them, but always encouraging. And like Mark says, I think he was just an inspiration to this whole generation uh, of young ethnobotanists um, you know, in an era where very much like now, you know, there's a revival of interest. People are saying, where do I go? Where do I go? Well, we can't send them to the great man anymore, so they have to find their own way. But there are people like Mark out there who is a tremendous spokesman for all this. And, uh, you know, and unlike some of us who just rest on our laurels and talk about the old days, <laughs> Mark's actually out there doing the work. I mean, he's he's an old guy, you can see, but he's he's in the field and he's doing stuff. And I have great admiration for that. You know, I mean, I go to the jungle for more than a week or 10 days at a time. I mean, you know, then I begin to question whether I'm going to survive. <laughs> you know, but he, he doesn't have the problem, so... <laughs> It's an interesting thing. Schultz, uh, I, I believe one of his first trips to the Amazon was in 1943, so right around the middle or beginning of World War II. Uh, and it's an interesting correlate that probably when you were meeting him, it was right around the Vietnam timeline or so. That's my guess. So it's a really interesting thing. You know, he's doing university work and not doing war, which is cool. Um, <laughs> so it's some sort of interesting uh, anti-war slash botany psychedelics connection. Well, Schultes was in the Amazon during World War II, but he was uh, not, he was doing a very special project. He was not, uh, he was helping his country with the war effort. And I think maybe it's better if I, I ask Mark to explain what that's about. I mean, it's really important, I think what he was doing it has nothing to do with hallucinogens. But yeah, please, Mark, if you want to enlighten us there, that'd be great. 
Well, Schultz has got to start as an ethnobotanist in the 30s with the Kiowa in Oklahoma, where he said he went into a teepee with the Indians and the peyote and came out a different man. And he said he was lost to uh, medical science forever, which I disagree with, but that's another story. He then did his thesis work, uh, PhD thesis work in Oaxaca, Mexico, and discovered, discovered the magic mushrooms. Of course, he always said that Ethnobotanists don't discover anything. The Indians were there long before. Uh, after that, he took a job as a government botanist in uh, the Colombian Amazon, 1941, September, and the war broke out a couple of months later. So he reported back to the embassy in Bogota to see what he needed to do. And they said, get your ass back to the jungle and cut rubber because the Japanese have taken over all the rubber plantations. So he always said that the history of our species could be written in terms of plants. And I think uh, this effort in the Colombian Amazon with the Hevia rubber was a proof of that. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the movie Embrace of the Serpent? Yes, we've all seen that. <laughs> yes. What's your take on that? Because I, when I was watching, I didn't realize that was kind of inspired by Schulte's journey down there. I thought the cinematography was spectacular. It really captured his pictures. If you haven't seen them, check out the book, Where the Gods Reign. Some of those photos will be reproduced in our uh, upcoming volume out of the conference in England. But when you see an ethnobotanist walk up to a shaman, he's just meant off from a couple of bucks for his most sacred plan. You understand that uh, they didn't quite do the homework to the degree they should have. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, it's it's a movie, but right. it, it, it does bring, uh, it's interesting that it does sort of bring this topic in front of more eyes, and I think that's one of the main things that our book, this conference that I helped organize, and I have to say helped organize, it was my idea, but you don't pull a conference off like this without lots and lots of help. So I was I something I wanted to do for many years. Finally, everything came together. And what is most important is the people, the colleagues in my field, such as Mark and uh, and many other people, Luis and Morgan Luna, Manolo Torres, and, you know, some very stellar people in this field. As soon as I sort of put this out that I want to do this conference, which we call ESPD 50 to commemorate the first one that happened 50 years ago, which Schultes organized in San Francisco in 1967. There was never any follow-up conference. So a lot's happened in the last 50 years. And we thought, I thought it was time to have a follow-up. And, and so when I got this idea and then I, I found a venue, a beautiful place to do it in the UK, kind of put the word out and uh, everybody stepped up. You know, people uh, in my field that I respect so much said, yeah, we, we, we're, we're on board with this. And we were able to get some funding to bring everybody to this venue. We had four very stimulating days. I'll send you the links to the videos uh, in a minute. And, uh, and we did it. And we were able to pre-sell this symposium volume, which is about to launch at the end of this month. The uh, proceedings of the 2017 uh, event, which were also printing, reprinting the proceedings from the 1967 event. So it's going to be a box set, collector's edition. It's gonna be a beautiful piece of work, actually. This and, looks like uh, a resource. Yeah, it's going to be a landmark publication in ethnopharmacology. So, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, it's a collective effort of what this community can do when they put their mind to it and come together. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it. And, uh, and, and, you know, I would like to say also with the videos, with the uh, event in, at Birmingham, what they did not have in 1967 was Facebook streaming, you know, and we, so we live streamed all of those uh, presentations in real time. And at times we had 
40 to 60,000 people watching those presentations. Wow. And, and I will say, I have to say that Mark's presentation was the top because he is a fantastic speaker. And I think we got 60,000 people clicking into your first presentation, Mark. So gracias for that. Well, that's nice of you to say, Dennis, but Schulte's always said, if you can't make hallucinogenic plants, naked people in rainforests interesting, you're in the wrong field. <laughs> well, that's, that's quite true. You're right. <laughs> and your keynote presentation, Mark, was about um, Schulte's life. Is that correct? I actually gave two presentations. Oh, okay. uh, you know, you have the very good biography of Schulte's done by Wade Davis called One River, but there was a lot of personal stuff that... Uh, I had experience in working closely with him and other people uh, had that just wasn't written down anywhere. He had a fantastic sense of humor. He was hilarious. And I'm convinced that one of the key to winning the trust of his indigenous colleagues was making them laugh. It's a human condition. And you don't find that in obituaries and scientific papers. And I just felt that was a side of his character that I wanted to bring forward. The other paper that I did was uh, the search for new jungle medicines. I mean, ethnobotany is art and science. In fact, most science is art and science. And we all have a slightly different take, and I wanted to share some of my experiences, some of the tricks of the trade, and uh, just put it out there because, you know, as you go through life, you have experiences and ideas and thoughts that technically don't show up in technical papers. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, Mark, what, what stood out for you at the event, at the conference? Anything well, particular? yeah, several things. One, one is that here are all of us guys who all know each other. We've all been in the same field for decades. And I learned something from every presentation I listened to, which shows you, A, how much is rich, how rich a, 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 a body of knowledge is out there, and also how much remains to be learned. I mean, if you compare the, the original conference 50 years ago with this one, about half the compounds or plants mentioned were new. So in 50 years, we learned a lot of new stuff, um, which says to me how much is out there to be learned. So on the one hand, it's a very exciting time to be an ethnobotanist or an ethnopharmacologist. On the other hand, it's very frustrating because at the same time where we're seeing this mainstream interest in these plants or fungi and compounds and bringing it into the mainstream and, and treating so-called incurable diseases is the same time we're looking at the homogenation of these indigenous cultures. And make no mistake, it's, we're not just talking about guys in the Amazon. We're looking at you know the peyote cultures uh, in the American West uh, we're looking at cultures that we have no name for that are disappearing as these forests are cut down. So we're burning the candles at both ends, which is the destruction of the cultures and the destruction of the vegetation, uh, the fungi, and even the animals. Because one of the things that was covered this time that nobody touched on last time was the use of the magic frogs of the Amazon, uh, which we say nobody knew. Well, of course people knew it. They were the Indians. But nobody had studied them before. And it shows, once again, the richness of what means to be learned. And the magic frogs being the, the frog that they do combo from or the sapo or... Um... <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that this fellow came up to me at the conference and said, well, you know, I'm a combo priest. Uh, <laughs> and I said, that's funny. You look like a white guy to me. Uh, and he said, oh, yes, I use the frog and I treat and I heal. And I said, okay, let me give you a test. Two words, Lauren McIntyre. And I got a blank look. Okay, Lauren McIntyre was an explorer. The source lake of the Amazon is Laguna McIntyre. The source lake of the Amazon was found by Lauren McIntyre after an extraordinary adventure where his life was saved by uncontacted Indians who rescued him and introduced him to the magic frog. Well, now you can buy this stuff on the internet, but all these guys running around calling themselves combo priests don't know where it comes from. Not from McIntyre, not from the Indians, and barely from the rainforest. I think you had a, a funny story about uh, the frog when you went back to one of the tribes that you studied with originally, and you're like, oh, this frog doesn't exist here. And they're like, oh, no, it, it exists up in the canopy. <laughs> and you've been studying for, for like 30 years, right? Yeah, I worked there 33 years. And when I was showing them pictures of the combo frog from Peru, they said, oh, that's here. And I said, no, it isn't. And they said, yes, it is. And I said, no, I worked here 30 years. I, you know, it's not here. 
And the shaman said, yes, it is. It's in the can me. You don't go up there. You're a botanist. And I said, so what do you use it for? And he said, hunting magic, which is what they use uh, the frog for in Peru and Brazil. And I said, so I've been here three decades. What he tell me? He says, well, you've been here for three decades. You didn't ask me. So the point being that we don't even know in some questions, in some cases, what questions to ask. Right. And it's a reflection on our ignorance, and it's a reflection on the richness of their knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, I think that one thing that emerges in this field and also definitely from this conference, you know, there are areas of investigation that you think are well covered, you know, and uh, there can't possibly be anything new uh, to contribute. And, and uh, the sort of the thrust of this conference was, was the pharmacologic search, search for psychoactive drugs. So the implication of that is sort of we're looking for new things. Well, there are plenty of new things out there, like the combo, for example, you know, which 50 years ago, nobody knew about that in even just a few years ago. But one of the things about the conference that really it was impressive to me, we had four, I think about four presentations on ayahuasca. We had an equal number, or maybe one less. We have also had presentations from peyote. These are two of the most studied of the, of the indigenous psychedelic plants. And yet, there was new information that was presented at these conferences. So, you know, even though we can think, well, peyote, what's left to learn about that? I was, what's left to learn about that? The fact is, any one of these things it's just begun. You know, mm. there is much more to be understood and learned about all of these things, even the one we think we know. And then you get to some of these obscure or less well-known things. And, you know, so is ethnopharmacology dead? Is, 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 it, is it reaching a dead end? I would say not. I would say that uh, hopefully this book will inspire a new generation. Because again, that point that Mark makes very well, when the habitats go, the people's knowledge go, the people mm -hmm. know. Not only the, the biota themselves that's out there, they're endangered, but equally and maybe more importantly, the knowledge is endangered because these people, they don't write stuff down. You know, it's all in their heads. And so it takes someone like Schultes or Plotkin or McKenna to a slight degree, whatever, to go and record this knowledge and just pay attention and, uh, and get it out. Because this is ultimately, uh, you know, uh, this is everyone's heritage. This is humanity's heritage, this knowledge. Yeah, I yes. think one of the fascinating things about this whole field, and, and Dennis has been a leader in this, is the whole concept of admixtures, because uh, back in Schulte's day, you went to look for a plant, and you found it, and that was it. But uh, Dennis has shown uh, how these sometimes seemingly innocuous have very powerful effects on potentiated, potentiated complex chemical reactions, which is almost an unknown field uh, that's where the doors of perception, to borrow a phrase, uh, are opening because our, our technology, our chemistry, our understanding of the natural world gets better. So the point here being is it's not a question of the medicine man uh, versus the microchip. It's this technology makes this stuff more important, more promising than ever before, because we can find, analyze, and manipulate molecules as never before. But the people who lead us to these molecules are the medicine women and medicine men. Hmm. I'm very curious if there is um, an exciting new compound or plant you learned about at the conference or um, maybe that just is very below the radar. I know, Mark, you've talked about these psychedelic uh, compounds present in lichens in the past, but I, is there anything new um, that we might not be aware yeah. of? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the term new is a loaded one. Right. Because... New, to, new to us. us right. Guys. Well, you know, I knew a little bit about Kratom going into the conference, but I was fascinated to learn uh, how effective it's proving in treating addiction. I mean, you can't pick up a newspaper or magazine these days without hearing about 
addiction, the opioid conference, yada, yada, yada. And here is yet another gift from the natural world, from the tropics, or in this case, the old world tropics, not the Amazon, which could be one of the answers. So, you know, on the one hand, we're trying to figure out what to do with this plague due to opiates. On the other hand, Mother Nature may have the answer at the same time. And so once again, uh, it's, it's almost a sort of shamanic circle of life that we end up back where we started. So is it new? It's not new to the people who have probably been using it for 10,000 years. Right. Uh, so that's why, what do you mean by new? It's like, what do you mean by discover? I mean, Columbus went to his grave thinking he discovered America. That would come as a surprise. So all the Indians were on the shore waiting for him when he, when he sailed up. Right, Dennis? Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, it, I mean, there's a couple of things. It's interesting that you mentioned Columbus and when he arrived on Hispaniola, uh, of course, it was an island of the Caribbean. It was not, you know, continental America. But the people there were using two kinds of uh, smokable materials. They were using tobacco and they were using uh, anthra snuffs. And uh, interestingly, Columbus was most impressed with the tobacco, with these people who drank smoke, as he put it. Hmm. So that's dramatic and interesting to him. So he took tobacco back to Europe with him, and we know, you know what that resulted in, essentially a health plague that you know, we're still experiencing. And that became a global drug. I've often wondered what would have happened if you'd taken an Anthra snuff, which is a DMT snuff back with him. You know, that might have changed Western consciousness in a slightly different way. Hi. But uh, it wasn't dramatic. You know, people would snuff it and then they just sort of sit there. Maybe they'd dance around, but there was no dramatic, you know, combustion with smoke and all of this. Uh, yeah, and, and, and then I think the other, the other thing that, uh, no, it is worth pointing out that this, this repository of indigenous knowledge is really, it, those are the true scientists in a certain way, because these are people that have kept this knowledge. They've been stewards of this knowledge for, in some cases, thousands of years. If it weren't for that, there would be nothing for the scientists to discover. I, I think time and time again, it's been shown that if you're looking for new compounds, the most effective way to do that is through ethnobotany. I mean, you can do high throughput massive screening all day long. It just doesn't do it. You know, I mean, the, the time is better spent talking with a person who actually uses these medicines in a real time situation. You can get that knowledge, you can put it, then you can go back to your you know, your receptor systems and your fractionation systems and all that. But you have the kernel of the knowledge from the medicine man who actually knows what these things are for. It, 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 you know, ethnobotany uh, beats uh, uh, mass screening every time. Um, hmm. it, another interesting example of that, and we didn't, well, we had one presentation on salvia divinorum which is the hallucinogenic Mexican mint. And uh, it, it's very interesting. Nobody knew much about it in 1967. It wasn't even mentioned to that conference. When chemists and pharmacologists finally got to it and focused in on it, it turns out that salvinorin A is a very, very interesting compound because it is absolutely selective for the kappa opiate receptor and nothing else. This does not happen in drug design. Uh, the, the person that did the pharmacology on this told me, you know, if I had set out to design a kappa opiate agonist using all the computer-aided uh, tools for molecular design, it wouldn't have looked like salvia divinorum. Huh. You know, it wouldn't have looked anything like it. He said, the stuff looks like cholesterol. I can't imagine why like <laughs> So nature is full of surprises, is I guess the take-home lesson. You know, no smart chemist would ever think of that particular molecular scaffold if they were trying to design a molecule to get those decisions. Hmm. I had this question asked once, uh, what's your family ethnobotany? And it took me a while to like, 
think about it. It's like, what plants do I use or what plants have my, my family used? And so it just got me thinking like, how can we like integrate this knowledge back into like Western culture where we're kind of like removed from, uh, I guess, plants, you know, some people are really interested, but I'd probably say majority <laughs> aren't. Well, this is part of what you do. You put out podcasts like this, you promote these books and these events. I think you just get people excited about it. You know, that, that's, that's what you do. I mean, in that respect, uh, you know, if, if Mark's not going to promote it, I am going to promote it. I think that this, this, uh, this interactive map that he's created with Brian Hitler and using a lot of material from Lloyd Davis's book, it's been a real collaborative thing. But if you want to know the history of ethnobotany and particularly, you know, uh, as it relates to Schultes, just visit the Amazon Conservation Team's website and spend some time with that map. I mean, Schultes was a incredible person. You know, I mean, he was a, a real naturalist in the Victorian sort of, you know, 19th century sense. Uh, there, there's just nobody else like that. No, or, I mean, well, you know, we're all getting old. Mark is probably one of the few left. There are people, but, uh, but you know, just check out those historical uh, precedents. I think it's very, uh, you know, it's very uh, worth looking in that way. I think you have to do something that inspires people. That's mm -hmm. the thing. And this was an inspiration. Yeah, I, I agree with Dennis on romance and adventure back into natural history and ex exploration. You know, in the age of the internet, people want to look at everything on their laptop instead of going there. And the, the great irony, going back to your question, is, gee, well, you know, we don't use plants anymore so much. And here we all are converging from all over the world to study how to use plants to kill incurable diseases. So, again, this comes back to this idea of burning the candle at both ends, that we're searching for things, whether it's a cure for cancer or whether it's spirituality because organized religion has failed us and the far end of the earth to do it. And meanwhile, the far ends of the earth are on fire. So it's, it's really quite stupid that we're destroying that which might save us. You know, the great ecologist Aldo Leopold said, the first rule of intelligent tampering is to save all the pieces. But we're not doing that when we're burning down the Amazon to produce more beef which doesn't strike me as something that the world really, really, really desperately needs more of right. uh, compared to clean water and uh, clean air and no greenhouse gases going into the air, which is exactly what's happening as forest has fell to uh, produce more cattle plantations. There's more cows in, in Brazil than there are Brazilians. Hmm. Than there are Brazilians. Oh, that's <laughs> But exactly, we as a species, we do not have any long-term perspective on these things and no uh, a, a consciousness apparently of what the impact is of our uh, profligate ways you know the way that we make new resources of the amazon to you know clear it down in cattle or or clear it in beans or palm oil yeah they are they will produce a lot a short-term economic return but at the same time they're they're you know, it's at the sacrifice of what is literally trillions of dollars, if you want to be dollars and cents about it, trillions of dollars of undiscovered blockbuster drugs that are hidden, waiting to be discovered in the Amazon. They're not going to be there if you cut it down. Right. You know, this is just obvious. And if, if, if governments of the world could come together, and even the pharmaceutical industry could come together and and collaborate in some way if they can set, a, set aside these areas of biodiversity that could be surveyed for new compounds. But then the tricky part is the intellectual property. Who really owns this knowledge? Or how is this mm. knowledge, how can it be equitably shared with the people that have been the stewards of the knowledge and the world, the global culture, that needs these medicines, you know, is there a 
way to work it out so everyone benefits? How can you do it ethically? Yeah, just to jump on, on, on top of what Dennis is saying, and this is covered in the uh, proceedings that are coming out soon from the conference. You know, we talk about the magic frog. When this conference was held 50 years ago, nobody knew there were any magic frogs. I mean, nobody outside the Amazon. This is being looked at to treat uh, the so-called incurable diseases like anxiety, depression, uh, end-of-life trauma, uh, PTSD, are, as I haven't seen this verified in the scientific publication, is being looked at, peptides are being looked at to treat drug-resistant bacteria, which is the greatest threat to our species of all, and what's the forest being destroyed for? To, to produce more meat and to make more palm oil. I mean, personally, I'd rather have cures for cancer than more Nutella, but uh, maybe that's because I'm just an ethnobotanist. So to Dennis's point, this whole cost-benefit thing, doing stupid short-term things that benefit a few people and destroying stuff that could benefit a lot more people in a much greater way is unfortunately seems all too common uh, manifestation of the way our, our species behaves, or I should say misbehaves. Hmm. What about some thoughts about the, like the sustainability of like psychedelics or the frog or anything like that? Um, you mean in terms of the sources of them? Yeah, you know, like with ayahuasca tours and people going down and using and taking like all that, or even with like the bufo toad, like um, people harvesting the five meo from it and kind of, you know, they're same with peyote. It's all yeah. like kind of a limited production versus consumption. Yeah, it's it's a pretty complex situation with ayahuasca tourism, for example. I think I think that uh, ayahuasca is not endangered. Ayahuasca, is, ayahuasca tourism, if anything, is leading. There's more ayahuasca being grown everywhere in the world than ever before. Uh, you know, so the tourism, which is definitely you know a multifaceted thing. There's dark sides and there are very positive sides. I don't think uh, that uh, a threat to the species is part of it because like any commodity that the world demands, you know, uh, the suppliers will rise to meet the demand. I mean, look what's happened with coffee or chocolate or so on, these sorts of things. With something like the toad, it's a different kind of story. You know, I mean, they can probably not be... Uh, you know, they, they can't be sustainably harvested. So if they're going to be widely used, and they can't really be synthesized. I mean, how can you synthesize a, a toad, you know, or these compounds there? Something like bufotenine is easy to synthesize. These peptides that you find in the toad, not so easy to, to synthesize. So, uh, you know, those things are more of a problem. Uh, uh, and, you know, this... I mean, it's a complex set of moving parts and, and interact, interlocking uh, concerns, you know, sustainability, preservation of indigenous knowledge, reciprocity, how do you keep the, the traditions of the culture even intact with all of these people going down? I mean, I think the people who, who go to the Amazon to seek ayahuasca, they're not thrill seekers by and large. They're sincere people looking, you know, for meaningful experiences, experiences for their own religious institutions. They're respectful. But then you get millions of them going down. How does that affect the economy and everything else of the indigenous people? I mean, we know that religious uh, ayahuasca church greatly change the economy. Uh, of, of Peru and mestizo society around Iquitos in some ways in good ways and other ways not so good ways so it, it's, it's complex yeah Dennis is Dennis is right uh, ayahuasca tourism is a two-edged sword and of course the joke in Iquitos Peru is that they should have ATMs in every corner ayahuasca teller machines so what, what I find amazing is you know you wouldn't hire a surgeon off the internet uh, would you look up some ayahuasca guy who may be a real shaman or might be a rent-a-shaman and have him fiddling around inside your head and soul 
uh, based on what TripAdvisor says. But that's right. the case. Now, done right, ayahuasca tourism can cure uh, terrible diseases. Done wrong, people die. Both are true. And we had a wonderful fellow at the conference in Turingham, a Marine, who had such wonderful uh, positive healing experiences after his tour of Afghanistan that he was taking other soldiers uh, for treatment and had a very positive record. The same token, uh, I have a shaman staying with now here in Virginia who tells me of watching little planes fly out of the, his jungle airstrip full of ayahuasca, and he doesn't know who they are, where they're going, and there's no reimbursement for the local people. As Dennis said, ayahuasca is rather a, a weedy vine, and I've seen it growing in Israel, I've seen it growing mm -hmm. in Hawaii. So Banisteriopsis copy is not going extinct. However, uh, the knowledge of how to use these things, there may be varieties that are disappearing in this rush towards commercialization. Uh, I would say that on the whole, it's somewhat positive with a lot of negatives, but it needs to be done uh, much better. Yeah, yeah. There's both positive and negative aspects to it and, and I, I sort of approach this maybe this is a cop-out but I fall back on the realization that as ayahuasca again and again tells me every time I take it which is often uh, you monkeys only think you're running the show you know and, and what it <laughs> actually is co-evolution you know and the plants are running the show you know, and, and, and the plants are, if you think about it, the plants are running the show for the entire, uh, um, uh, for all of life on Earth, essentially, for what is going on on Earth, because they are sustaining life on Earth through photosynthesis. If the plants go away, the show stops. We could go away and the show would go on, and in fact, probably in a much more healthy way, but you know, because plants play this essential role in maintaining carbon dioxide and oxygen balances uh, in the, on, a, on a global level, among other things, I can sort of think of it as, you know, this is part of a co-evolution. And, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, this isn't a scientific notion, but I often have the feeling that ayahuasca has escaped from its home in order to appear on a global stage because it has an urge, urgent me message for the monkeys. <laughs> you know, and the monkeys, the message is basically, wake up, you clowns, you're wrecking this place. You know, that's the message. And, you know, more and more people are getting it now, whether they go back and change their lives. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process. Uh, you know, propagating these ideas and sharing these ideas and then you have the evolutionary catalyst in terms of the psychedelic plants, especially ayahuasca, and I'd say mushrooms too, but ayahuasca seems to be the superstar right now. And so many people go down for these experiences and they come back with appreciation you know, for the delicacy of our, of our planet and our, our ecosystem and so on. Some actually <coughs> Changing their life, propagating the message. So, you know, um, in some sense, I take some comfort in knowing that the plants are running things, and I'm sure they're a lot smarter than we are. So. Yeah, the most eloquent uh, written version of what Dennis has just been saying is by Michael Pollan in his book, The Botany of Desire, that there's a whole theory out there the plants are just using us to pollinate them and move them around uh, very effectively. And uh, he's coming out with a new book, which I'm reading, which is called Changing Your Mind, which is the use of hallucinogens uh, to treat these terrible ailments that Western medicine, in particular Western psychiatrists, seem so inept at treating, much less curing. But one point that, that he and, more importantly, the, the physicians uh, that he writes about make very clearly is that psychedelic psychotropic substances should not be used by people who are psychologically uh, delicate. Shamans will say often that they won't treat schizophrenics because, you know, they come apart under the influence of these uh, powerful substances. You know, you have to remember that hallucinogens are essentially vegetal scalpels that allow shamans and other healers to dissect, uh, diagnose, analyze, treat, and sometimes cure the human mind. 
but the fact that some people do have very bad experiences, uh, that there are regular reports of, of ayahuasca treatments gone bad, is proof that this is not something to be trifled with. And yes, there are plants, and yes, plants by and large are safe, but not all of them. You know, strychnose is a plant. Strychnine is a plant compound. Uh, cocaine is a plant compound. And again, this is another example of a two-edged sword. So people need to regard this stuff uh, with the seriousness it deserves. How do you think this book that Michael Pollan's putting out, it's coming out in May, right? How do you think uh, it's going to be received? Well, you know, he has a tremendous following, well-deserved. He's a wonderful writer and a careful researcher. And I remember about three or four years ago, there was a headline story in the front page of the Wall Street Journal saying, uh, magic mushrooms induce spiritual experiences. <laughs> Breaking news, right? Uh, so all of us would we, roll our eyes at this, but it's big news to a lot of people. So I think that Michael's book will do more of this, which is guys like uh, all of us here will sort of roll our eyes and going, duh, or what's the news, or isn't this great? And most of the people that will read it really will open their eyes and uh, open their minds as well, I'm, I'm willing to bet. So I think it's, it's likely to be a tremendously positive shot in the arm for everything from shamanism to clinical trials of psilocybin. But, you know, it ain't going to come down to any one book, whether it's Michael Pollan's or this wonderful new volume that's coming out as a result of our conference. We live in an age of fractured media. It's not like the old days when I was growing up where you put something on a National Geographic special and 30 million people would tune in. You need websites, you need podcasts, you need films, you need magazine articles, uh, because there is no one way to reach uh, even a mass audience in the ways it was true, say, 30 or 40 years ago. Right. I, I think uh, I, I'm glad you brought up Michael Pollan, because I think he is, he is an influencer, and I think his book, I'm a great admirer of his work. But I think this is, book is going to get a lot of notice. I think this is going to be another catalyst, in some ways, probably more, more influential even than ESPD-50, although I hate to say that, but ESPD-50 is kind of for specialists and people that know it. His book is directed to a mass audience. There's no doubt, or very little doubt, it's going to be at the top of the New York Times bestseller list, deservedly so. And, and his other books, Mark mentioned The Botany of Desire, and I would also mention The Omnivore's Dilemma, um, have been tremendously influential books in the way we think about our relationship to plants and food and the whole global systems that sustain that. Uh, in that respect, I wanted to mention another excellent article by Michael Pollan in The New Yorker called uh, The Intelligent Plant. Uh, which if you Google it, that will come up. And best, most cogent discussion of this crazy topic of plant intelligence, which is now getting a lot of notice. It's, it's no longer, you know, pseudoscience. It never was pseudoscience, but a lot of people are talking now about, yeah, plants have a kind of intelligence. It's not like us. They don't have brains. But if intelligence is reflected by an ability to make your, your environment optimal, plants are masters of this. This is what they do. And you know how they do it? They do it through chemistry. So plants, the, the, plant, the language of plants, in a sense, is chemistry. That's why they're so good at it, because they do photosynthesis. Anyway, look, we don't need to get off on a tangent here, but that's <laughs> worth mentioning, I guess. <laughs> I'm curious if either of you have any um, kind of commentary on uh, n negative trends in the psychedelic world you might be seeing, um, or, or just really uh, great opportunities. You know, obviously we talked about ethnobotany. I agree more people should be doing ethnobotany. I don't know how much college education you need to just start going to the Amazon, but you know, perhaps some, um, what, what, what do you think? Uh, how would you like to respond to that kind of statement? You know, it's hard to write history while it's happening. 
And there's so much going on in the field that it never means it's good and bad. And so trying to understand it as it's happening for me is impossible. I think the fact that we're talking about it is a, is a positive, good thing. When I was an undergraduate student studying this in Schultz's classroom, there were no podcasts. So technology combined with shamanic uh, wisdom and plants and fungi and frogs is a powerful tool. But inevitably, there will be people hurt by this. Inevitably, there will be a species endangered by this. I worked in Oaxaca, where Schultes found the mushrooms for a month. And the woman told me the two mushrooms, two healing mushrooms, she had learned as an apprentice no longer existed because the climate had already changed. That was mm -hmm. 20 years ago. So on the one hand, doors are opening. On the other hand, doors are closing. I don't think uh, there's a doubt on any of our parts, you guys or Dennis and me, that there's tremendous reasons for optimism and hope, but at the same uh, time, there are reasons for concern and dread. And you don't want to make this too popular because people will die. It's, it's already happened. It'll happen more. But if it's done right, uh, and when I say right, it means proper respect for the environment, pro proper respect for the plants and animals, fungi, pro proper respect for the shamans, uh, that there wouldn't seem to be a downside. But humanity is not a species which always gets everything right. Quite the opposite in, in some cases and certainly in many cases. Quite true. And I, th I think, again, this speaks more to the human character of, than, than some of these things. I'm, I'm fond of saying, and I, I do believe it, there is no such thing as a bad drug. There are plenty of bad ways to use drugs, but the point being that with any technology, and drugs are kind of technology, the moral dimension comes out of human behavior. You know, we can choose to use technologies in beneficial ways or in harmful ways. So what we need is clarity about the use that we put to these things and the context in which that use takes place. You know, so uh, so that is part of the, you know, the conundrum that we face as this topic gets gets more and and more popular, more and more people get interested in it, and so on. Uh, and I think the answer is education. You know, it doesn't have to be formal academic education, although that never hurts. You know, because it gives you a background of knowledge that you might not have otherwise. Ethnobotany is still an area where amateurs can make a contribution. But I do tell people, uh, I get asked by many students, I want to do a career in ethnobotany, how do I approach it? I've always thought that mentors are the most important, the best. But, you know, if you want to join if you want to get involved in ethnobotany you know join the society for economic botany that's step one you know or read some of these things in other words find out who else find the others as my <laughs> brother fond of saying you know and if you want to be an ethnobotany botanist it just makes sense to be a member of the society for economic botany because you know that's the professional society if you want to know who is active in that area then that you know you can join it doesn't cost much if you're a student you can go to their meetings you can network you can find out what's hot in the field so that's one way for people to get in awesome could be said but yeah, I'm curious, uh, you know, being like the psychedelic elders in the community, um, something that you've guys learned from your teachers and something that you've like integrated and now what, what, what are some bits of wisdom that you can pass down to like our, the younger generation and our generation that are, are getting into this and, you know, want to help move it forward? Schultes told me the difference between an ethnobotanist and an anthropologist is when the shaman leans forward and passes you the hallucinogenic potion, the anthropologist says, oh, no, I can't take that. I lose my objectivity, whereas the ethnobotanist says, yeehaw. <laughs> That's awesome. I think they call that participatory ethnography, Mark. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, that, that's, that's the thing. It's... It's, uh, you know, it's a delusion to think that you can separate yourself. You're not, 
you know, you go into this culture, you are immersed in the culture, you're immersed in that cosmology and worldview. Don't say no to it, you know, dive deeper. Um, you know, um, uh, I, I think that's a good way to do it. You know, at the same time, you don't have to go, you don't have to completely, you know, lose your common sense, uh, you know, in, in the talking about psychedelics, again and again, this issue of set and setting comes up. And as we learn to use psychedelics in a medical context for therapeutic purposes, it's not really about the medicines, it's as much about the context in which they are administered and these therapeutic uh, you know, applications are made. That's done through careful uh, attention to set and set. The same is true in the real world, you know, like uh, as Mark pointed out, if you're an ayahuasca tourist and you're, you're utterly clueless, you don't have any knowledge <laughs> How it is, what the situation is down there. You're, you're, you are likely to stumble into a place that you'd rather not be. So, if you if you want a rewarding experience, you uh, you know do a little homework, talk to the people that know the lay of the land. TripAdvisor probably not your most reliable source, <laughs> although. <laughs> It could be worse. It could be Yelp. It could be worse. Look for the negative ratings. <laughs> <laughs> right. Trip advisor. Kind of an ironic uh, title there. <laughs> a friend of the show is helping put together a site called uh, psychedelicexperience.net where we're hoping to get kind of peer-based reviews specifically around facilitators and centers. It's kind of similar, and he's trying to do like a data-based approach to experience documenting, kind of like Airwid does, but you can actually pull the data when you want to run the numbers on certain things, which I think will mm -hmm. be cool from a research point of view, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how the um, yeah. <laughs> proto-Yelp or <laughs> Yelp uh, of psychedelics will, I don't know. There is so you, a... hope to get, you hope to get rated five vines? <laughs> and we do it mushrooms. We do five mushrooms. <laughs> There's a place. I think it, I think I've misspelled it here, but it's Aya Advisor. Yeah, I've seen that. Dot com, and it, it's sort of modeled after TripAdvisor. You know, the problem is the same as with TripAdvisor. You know, the reports are not vetted, so you don't really know if you're looking for a false report, a false report, or a report. Um, but at least, again, it's another, it's another uh, tool that people should be aware of. Um, right. So we're, we're playing part in this retreat down in Jamaica. There's legal, apparently psychedelic mushrooms are legal there. And uh, we're, we're doing a big uh, seven day retreat coming up and Kyle and I don't really know too much about Jamaica. So say we wanted to, um, you know, do Mark, you kind of mentioned do good business. Like, you know, we're, we're stealing essentially patents from native cultures. It's not necessarily the same in Jamaica, but how could we leave a po positive benefit in a place like Jamaica, like leave, uh, handprints instead of just footprints and trash. You know, that's a difficult question that, that mm. deserves a more detailed uh, answer than I can give in a hurry. But, you know, taking mushrooms in Jamaica, it's not like going to Colombia and taking ayahuasca where it's from. You're talking about something which is not part of the culture and mm. which is grafted on. So in some ways it makes it easier. But I think the rules of ecotourism are true no matter where you go and what you do, which is does all the money go to Kingston or New York or London or do the locals make a fair living wage? It's quite astonishing how many eco lodges in the Amazon pollute the place around them or, or over harvest the fish or shoot animals or stuff like that. So I think common sense is one good rule and another is, uh, you know, look at TripAdvisor. Uh, see what people say on the web uh, as to whether a place deserves a clean bill of health or not. Mm. Yeah, Dennis, do you have any comments or feedback? Uh, well, no, not really. I think, I think uh, Mark makes a good point. You know, uh, Jamaica, 
doesn't have a tradition of of mushroom use. It happens to be mushrooms are legal there. I assume they're legal. Are, are you the guys that are organizing this retreat, or you're just attending? We are we are kind of co-producers. Eric Osborne from Myco Meditations is putting it on, and he he's bringing us down as facilitators. Okay, okay. Well, it's a different context. You're in a third world country. You're in a place where uh, you know mushrooms are not part of the cultural tradition, so you'll get no support from there. Again, I just think it's uh, it's a matter of careful control of the venue, the bedding. I don't know what year may not be involved. I organize, have been organizing some retreats in, in Peru off and on for the last four years. And uh, we uh, vet our people pretty, pretty thoroughly, you know, and that's, I think that's part of it. You know, we all, I always do a Zoom conference before anyone actually gets accepted. And I, we have a, we have a seven-page uh, medical form that everybody has to fill out. Know. So, uh, you know, we try to control as many variables as possible and, and make sure that people have a, you know, I guess mainly that they come to the experience with uh, a, a knowledge base. You know, they're as informed as they can possibly be. And we get people who are absolutely no experience with psychedelics to people that are, you know, 30 year veterans with psychedelics. So it covers the whole spectrum. So information. And then once you're there, I think you have to focus on safety so that people feel comfortable. They feel like they're in a safe place. They don't have to worry about these external world issues. You know, I mean, if they're a woman, they not have to worry that they're going to be molested, these sorts of things just created uh, an environment and uh, essentially a, a sacred space and time, I think, where people can have their experience in a safe place and then help them to integrate. That's also very important. I hear about so many of these ayahuasca centers where they go, you know, they take ayahuasca seven days straight without any integration. They send these people off. You know, I mean, no wonder things go off. Uh, yeah, it reminds me of that old Chris Rush routine where he said, yeah, they're doing these lab experiments with uh, THC. They're giving a hamster the, a piece of hashish the size of a table, and then they wonder why it won't run on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> We've been recording for about an, uh, a little under an hour. And uh, if you guys want to plug your websites and plug the book one more time, I think that would be good. I work for the Amazon conservation team, www.amazonteam.org for psychonauts and other people interested in ethnobotany. You should check out our Schulte storybook map, which has much of the origin of magic mushrooms, the discovery of ayahuasca and other snuffs. But it's a place to start. And I encourage everybody who wants to find out what's going on in the field to check out the upcoming uh, proceedings of the conference that Dennis is the editor of, uh, Tango Snyder, who edited Schulte's classic uh, books of photographs, Where the Gods Reign and Vine of the Soul. This needs to be on the bookshelf right to those. Yeah. Awesome. And I put, to, I put the link to Mark's website up here and also hefter.org, which I hope you all know about. That's my only claim to any kind of institutional affiliation at the moment since I'm not teaching at the university anymore. Um, I also wanted to mention this BBC program. We were talking about information resources. Uh, BBC came out with a wonderful series a few years ago called From Roots to Riches, made in uh, collaboration with Kew Botanical Garden. So I put the link up there to that series. That's it's a way to you know, get students enthused and also learn a lot of history in the, of uh, exploration um, um, in the 19th century that led to scientific discovery. Thank you both, uh, Dr. Mark Pluck and, and Dennis McKenna. Uh, we'll get this up soon, and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing this up on the web. 
Thanks for tuning in again, everybody. We really hope you enjoyed the show with Mark, Cl- Mark Plotkin and Dennis McKenna. It was really fun for us and kind of um, kind of really changed us a bit because now we're thinking more about plants again and not just compounds. So it was really fun. And we really appreciate those guys spending time with us to uh, share stories and, um, you know, get us... Get us all a little bit more educated. And also check out their book, ESPD50.com. And uh, I'm sure you'll be seeing more links from us in the near future. Thanks again to Bluebird Botanicals for sponsoring the show. Really appreciate them. They are independently lab tested. So you can go on their site to check out the purity ratings and to see if there's any impurities that you might not want. Um, Spoiler alert, there are not any impurities you're not going to want in there. They are really high end company and I, I really really trust them and, and appreciate what they're doing to move the uh, future of CBD as um, <laughs> supplement forward. Yeah, I have to be careful with the language there because uh, DEA is always watching. Same with the FDA. But yeah, CBDs are wonderful. They're non-psychoactive and I find them very helpful personally. Um, Jury is still out clinically, but do some research. You owe it to yourself to at least read up on CBDs generally and then to also read up on Bluebird more specifically. So again, if you want to join us in Jamaica, please let us know. We'd love to have you. The retreat is from May 16 through 23, a little over a month away. We are very excited and can't wait. There's going to be three mushroom sessions, two breathwork sessions, and a lot of time spent uh, talking community and learning together. So definitely would love to have you. To learn more, go to michaelmeditations.com. And if you want to support us and don't have the spare funds right now, tell your friends about psychedelics today or listen to all our episodes. Let us know what you think. Uh, We'd love to have some feedback on that. And even better for us might be reviews on iTunes or Facebook or Google or Stitcher, whatever podcast app you're using. We'd just love to have more feedback. And if you want to get in touch with us, the email is psychedelicstodayemail at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you all for listening to the show and hope you tune in again for the next one. <laughs>